Welcome to lesson two. This is where we start to dive a little deeper and start to get a little more technical, but still nothing too terrifying. As I mentioned in the intro, I want to be that guy that I wished was around when I was learning, telling you where to click, what to switch on, what to switch off, where to store your files, and so on. My goal is to make this initial setup as step-by-step -step and simple as possible, so we can get to the fun stuff faster. Also, the setup that I'll be describing, apart from the most basic aspects, is one that has worked personally for me. Like all great pieces of software, Unreal is very versatile, and there is often more than one way to achieve an effect or look that you might be going for. So I'd like you to think of the following setup as a good base, and feel free to change and adapt it to your personal requirements once you gain more confidence. Here's what we'll be covering. Downloading and installing Unreal Engine 5.1, using the Epic Games Launcher, creating your first project and file storage, which plugins and settings to activate for filmmaking, the Unreal interface, setting up lighting for an environment, adding and importing assets, quality settings, and migrating assets. Let's start with the obvious first step, downloading and installing Unreal Engine 5.1. First, visit unrealengine.com and click on the blue download button in the top right hand corner. This will take you to the download screen where you can check your required specs and then scroll down to download the Epic Games Launcher. Once the launcher is ready, open it up, open the library tab, move to the top right hand corner again and select the latest version of Unreal Engine 5.1 to install. It's quite a large file, over 50 gigabytes, so allow a bit of time and a bit of space on your drive. Once it's downloaded and installed, you should see it in the Engine Versions section of the Launcher Library. I've got a few different versions here already, obviously, but you should just have the one. Click Launch and let it do its thing. The Unreal Launch window should appear with the message Compiling Shaders. This will take a while, anywhere between 5 to 15 minutes, depending on the speed of your computer. After a while, another window will appear where you can decide what kind of project you want to make. There are a few different templates based on what you're using Unreal for, but we're going to use film and TV and then blank. We're going to call the project setup. We're going to choose the starter content and ray tracing, and then we're going to click create. Then guess what? We're going to wait for the shaders to compile. Hopefully you'll only have to do this one more time. A quick word on what we're doing here. Ray tracing, in terms of a 3D environment, is how light bounces around. When a light source shines into a room in the real world, it doesn't just illuminate the spot right in front of it. The light will, you know, reflect. It'll bounce off different objects in various ways. Some surfaces will absorb it, some will reflect it, some will scatter it. This can be quite processor intensive, depending on the complexity of your scene, but Unreal has developed a built-in ray tracing solution called Lumen, which is far friendlier on your computer, so that takes quite a bit of the load off. We'll be using a combination of both, which we'll go over in the next lesson. And another quick note about exactly where your project is saving to. When it imports assets, Unreal converts them into a proprietary format for use inside the program. What this means is that once an asset is imported, you can delete, rename or relocate the folder where it came from, and it won't have an effect on your project, unlike other platforms like Adobe Premiere which reference their assets externally. This is good in the sense that your projects are very self-contained and fairly easy to organize. However, depending on how complex they grow, the projects can also become quite large memory-wise, so just remember to keep an eye on that every now and then. Anyway, your shaders are compiled and you finally have the Unreal window open. Time to start playing, right? Wrong. Now we need to install some plugins and change some project settings to make our filmmaking life easier. If you're working on a PC with an NVIDIA graphics card, then the first thing we're going to do is install the DLSS plugin for Unreal, which in my opinion is an absolute must for digital filmmaking. To say it will reduce your render times dramatically is a total understatement, so let's get that working first. Open up the Epic Games Launcher again, and in the Marketplace tab, do a search on DLSS. There should only be one result, so click on that, then click on External Link. You'll get a notification that you're headed to an external site, which is fine. Click Continue. Then, on the NVIDIA site, agree to the user agreement, and you'll be given the options for downloading the plugin. Choose the most recent version of Unreal 5. Once that's downloaded, unpack the zip file, 
and copy the folders DLSS and DLSS Movie Pipeline support. Then go to C, Program Files, Epic Games, UE 5.1, Engine, Plugins, and paste them there. Here you can see the folders that I've pasted earlier. Now head back to Unreal. Up in the top right hand corner here is where we can access our plugins and program settings. Two features you'll be using a fair amount. Open up plugins and do a search on DLSS. And now there should be two options. Go ahead and click both. You'll get a prompt to restart the program, but don't do it just yet. We still have a few things to do. So what did we just do there? Well, I don't pretend to understand the science behind it, but basically the DLSS plugin uses AI to create virtual texture enhancements without cost to your graphics card. It's basically creating detail from nothing, and it's kind of amazing and a little bit scary. As I mentioned before, it will also dramatically reduce your render times, literally from hours to minutes. I'm not being sponsored by them, I'm not being paid to say this, it is just that good to have. Okay, so back to Unreal again. While we still have the plugins window open, we're just going to find the plugin for the QuickTime ProRes video codec and activate that. And then, while we're at it, the plugin for water tools, which may come in handy later, depending on your project. Let's also make sure the HDRI backdrop is switched on, which we'll go over in lesson three. Hop out of plugins and open up project settings. There's a few things here we need to change. Find virtual textures and set it to enabled. We'll go over why this is useful in episode five. Find auto exposure and make sure it's turned off. This might be useful in games where your character is moving between dark and light environments, but we want a little more control over our lighting for filmmaking. For the dynamic illumination method, make sure it's set to lumen, as mentioned before. Motion blur is on. Make sure hardware ray tracing when available. Support hardware ray tracing and ray traced shadows are on. And finally, set anti-aliasing to TSR. Anti-aliasing smooths out the edges of your assets, and there's a few different methods, but TSR currently seems to be the best one. Here's it on and off. Shadow mode is set to virtual shadow maps by default, which gives more realistic graduated shadows, but this can be intensive on your system. If you're finding things are running slowly or you're getting out of memory errors, this is one of the first things you might want to change in the project settings, back to regular shadow maps. And then restart, and guess what? It's going to compile the shaders. Last time, I promise. After this, your projects will open far more quickly. So here we are, the Unreal main window. New project, blank slate. If you've ever played an FPS shooter, then moving around inside should feel very familiar, as it's basically the same controls. Right click and drag to look around, left click and drag to move backwards or forwards, mouse wheel to zoom in or out. You can also use the keyboard arrow keys to walk around the scene. If things are moving a little too fast, then you can use the camera speed button to make adjustments. You could use eight for zooming around large areas very quickly, or one, two, or three for fine adjustments. There's five main areas we're going to look at. The project window, the content browser, the outliner, the details panel, and the main control bar. Let's start at the top with the control bar. First up at the top left is the save icon, which seems pretty simple, but actually presents one of the little quirks that can catch the unwary. Let's take a quick look at a hot tip. The way Unreal works is that you can have multiple levels with different environments in the same project. For example, you might have your interior set on one level, but any exteriors are built in another. This is a good way to spread your work out if required, and not let one level become too cumbersome. There's no sense in Unreal having to process assets that your camera can't see. However, just clicking Ctrl S doesn't actually save everything. It only saves files in the current level you're working on. The safer option is to get into the habit of clicking Ctrl Shift S to save all the unsaved files in a project. Let's go ahead and save our current level as Setup. Moving along, we have this dialog box, which allows you to select from various modes. Select, landscape, foliage, mesh paint, fracture, brush editing, and animation. In this course, we're only really gonna be looking at four of those, starting with select, which is the basic mode for maneuvering assets around in the project window. 
Next, we get this little drop-down menu for adding and importing various assets. You'll be getting used to this one very quickly, as you'll be using it a lot. Then we have the Blueprint menu. Blueprints are little pieces of code that you can build into your project, but don't let the word code scare you too much. Unreal uses a node-based system, so creating a blueprint is actually a very visual process, and they can be used for creating useful effects such as a customizable camera shake. This is the sequence drop-down for adding new animation or movie sequences to your Unreal project. A sequence is a timeline where you can drag and keyframe any assets that you wish to use in a particular animation, and we'll start going into more depth than that in Lesson 3. These are your simulation buttons, largely used if you're building a game and testing the gameplay. You may not use these so much in filmmaking, but there will be situations where they come in handy, so we'll cover that in a future lesson. Platforms and session browsers deal largely with game development or sharing a project across multiple platforms, and you don't really have to worry about them for now. I've never actually even touched these buttons. VP Rolls and Pixel Streaming are very new at the time of writing, but they seem to deal with fairly high-end virtual production. Moving down to the window itself, over on the left we have the Viewport options. I'd leave most things on by default. Show FPS is a handy thing to have on, if only to see how much your computer may be slowing down in a particular project. Game View and Immersive Mode can be useful shortcuts to remember. Pressing G will get rid of all the control widgets on screen and just show you assets. F11 toggles immersive mode on and off for full screen. We want to allow camera shakes. And finally, high resolution screenshot will let you take a screen grab of your work, which will save into the following folder. The size multiplier will increase the resolution, but I personally wouldn't take this number above three. The perspective button gives you the option of various views, which will be familiar to anyone with even a basic knowledge of 3D programs. These are in wireframe mode by default, but you can choose the viewing mode. You can also choose between default or cinematic viewports, where cinematic will give you more direct control of a sequence timeline. The next button lets you decide exactly how the main window displays. Mostly you'll just be staying on lit, but you may find yourself moving to the far less intensive unlit, just to set up movements and animations if things start chugging too much. Show allows you to choose which features show up in the real-time window. Personally, I would just leave these on the defaults. Scalability lets you choose the display quality of your project. It's tempting to leave everything on cinematic, and you may find that that works out for you a lot of the time. But once again, if things start to slow down, these are some of the first settings you should tweak. Just be aware that dropping the quality to medium or low will require the shaders to rebuild, which could take a while. Moving on, when in select mode, these are the tools for moving an object around in the viewport. Let's go to our Add Asset drop-down and bring a basic cube into the viewport. To adjust our cube, we have the options of Select, Translate, Rotate, and Scale. Pretty self-explanatory, and you can adjust individual control bars to change assets along individual axes. Just be aware that distorting them like this will also distort any existing textures. These three buttons allow you to snap your movement to a grid or have items moving freely. I often switch these off, but the rotate one can be useful for keeping items aligned to a particular axis. For example, when constructing buildings or walls. That way you know exactly which angle you're rotating. Right, let's move down to the content browser. This is where you're going to store all your assets. Models, animations, textures, materials, audio, effects. Basically, anything that you'll use in your production will be stored here. Now, let's just look at how Unreal organizes itself, because it's useful to know where things are going. Let's say, for example, that I want to put some textures on this cube. I can go ahead and create a new folder in content called cube, and then we can navigate to our project folder, and you'll see that this folder has been created here as well. This knowledge will be useful shortly when we look at importing assets. The content browser is pretty simple, and we'll be coming back to it a lot, so we don't need to go into too much depth just yet. So let's just move up to the details window. The details window gives you access to any settings you may need to change in your assets. Some of these settings you may change a lot, many you will never need to touch, based on the asset. And finally, all of your assets are listed up here, in the outliner. Unreal projects can get very large, very quickly, with tons of assets floating around in this window. And that's where it's useful to start organizing pretty much straight away. Let's take a look at how to organize and create a basic environmental lighting setup at the same time. If you've been following along, you should have something like this, a checkered floor with a cube sitting on it. 
We're going to go ahead and delete everything in the outliner window except the cube and the floor, which will also remove them from the scene. Now you should be left with a dark window. The cube and floor are still there, you just can't see them at the moment because we need to reintroduce some lights. In the outliner, right click and choose create folder. Call it environment light. Now we're going to go to our drop down and choose lights and directional light. Now we can see stuff again, but it's still a little weird. Here's another neat trick though. Click in the project window, hold down control L and move the mouse around. This will enable you to relocate what is basically your sunlight in the scene. Now, in the outliner, click and drag your directional light into the environment light folder. Head back to the add button, and now we're going to choose visual effects and sky atmosphere. So now we're getting somewhere, and when you move the light around now, you get some nice sunset effects. In the outliner, move the atmosphere into the environment light folder. Add to lights and skylight. This starts to add a little bounce and indirect light into your scene, adding to the realism. In the details, click on real-time capture, then move that into the environment light folder. Now we're going to add visual effects and exponential height fog to add a little bit of haze. I like to scroll down in the details panel and check volumetric fog here, so that it's more affected by lighting. Move that into your lighting folder. While you're at it, click on Directional Light and scroll down in the Details panel until you reach Light Shaft Bloom and Light Shaft Occlusion and click them both on. This will add a nice glow to your light when it is directly facing the camera and the occlusion setting will allow the glow to be blocked by foreground objects. Here we see it on and off. Finally, we're going to add effects and volumetric cloud and move that into your lighting folder. If we move the Directional Light around now with Control L you'll see that the sunlight actually moves behind these clouds for some really nice effects. Okay, great. You've created your first environmental lighting setup and organized it in the outliner. We can switch these elements off individually using the eyeball icon or all together by hiding the folder. If you haven't already, Control shift s to save your project. Now let's take a very basic look at importing assets. Let's go ahead and download a free asset from the Unreal Marketplace. Open the launcher, Head to the Marketplace tab and choose Free Epic Games Content. Then click on this Decoration Pack. I've already purchased it, so it reads as Owned, but yours should say Free. Click on Free, and once it's ready, click Add to Project. Because Unreal 5.1 is very new, some of these asset packs may not recognize it yet, so you may need to click Show All Projects, choose Setup, and then choose the last version of Unreal that the asset pack was compatible with. Then click Add to Project. Once that's finished, head back to Unreal, and you should now see a new folder called TM Decorations Pack 1. It may also take a little while to build the shaders before these items display correctly. Depending on how they import, sometimes the actual meshes or objects for these collections can be buried a little deep in the filing system. So here's what I like to do. Just click on the top level folder, and then scroll to this little icon that looks like Wi-Fi, click it, and choose Static Mesh. You'll now see that the folder is only displaying all the static meshes or objects inside it, which you can choose, drag and drop into your project window. You can activate or deactivate this content browser filter at any time, but I find it incredibly useful, so I generally just have it ready to switch on and off when I'm creating a scene. That's hopefully all quite straightforward, but what if you didn't want all of those items? What if, for example, you just wanted this one cactus for your scene? If we have a look at the size of the folder we just added, it's over one and a half gigs. And if we're just using the cactus, then most of that is unused space. This is where we can look at migrating the assets we need. So here's a little trick I like to use, which is creating a project just for storage space. Let's go ahead and delete that folder we just created by highlighting it and clicking delete on the keyboard. This may take a while depending on how many assets the folder contains. I'm gonna speed this up by 1000% so you can get an idea of the process and not get too worried if it's taking a while. Once that's done, save and quit out of Unreal. Go back to the launcher to start a new project, and this time we're gonna go for film blank. We're going to call it storage, but we're gonna switch off starter content and ray tracing, then hit create. If we're using the analogy of the movie studio, then we're gonna think of this project as our props warehouse. It is literally for storing assets to be used in other projects. So heading back to the launcher and the marketplace, we're gonna find those assets again, Add to project, but this time we're going to put them into storage.
Once that's done, open up the folder, and let's say we just want to take these three cacti. Shift click to select multiple assets, right click on one, choose asset actions, and migrate. This is going to show you a window that lists all the assets related to those cacti, textures, materials, etc. Then click OK. Now it's going to ask you where to put it. Highlight the content folder in the project setup, then click select folder. That should copy across pretty quickly. Now shut down storage and reopen setup. Hey, wait, where's our environment lights that we set up? Everything's gone back to default. Is that a problem? No, because you saved that as a new level, remember? Here it is in the content folder. Go ahead and double click on that, and there's everything you need, as good as new. You should also see that the decorations pack folder has been created with just the cactus sculpture in it. And if we look at the file size, we've dropped from 1.5 gigs to just over 50 megabytes. Find their meshes and drag them onto the project. You'll see them appear in the outliner as well. Shift click to select all three, right click, then choose move to and create new folder. This places all three objects in a new folder on the outliner, which you can call cacti. Try to get into the habit of organizing new imports into folders as you add them to the project, as it can get a little messy later on otherwise. So that's a pretty good intro to the basics. At this point, I would even encourage you to pause for a little while, a couple of days even, to go over what we've covered and familiarize yourself with the program, importing and migrating assets, folder organization, lighting, etc. We're going to be going over individual settings later, but for the meantime, just experiment. Click things on and off, move sliders up and down, change parameters, see what happens. Just play. If your lights get too out of whack and you don't quite know how to bring them back to normal, then just delete everything and rebuild following the original process, which will help familiarize you with it. There is really very little that you can do wrong at this stage, so go nuts, see what happens, and I'll see you in lesson three.